Hey everyone, this is Ole Sharanki from Laddering Your Success, and you're listening to the LYS Podcast. All right, folks, here we are. We are back here with part two of our conversation with Cleo Franklin Jr. Cleo, how you doing? Thank you so much for joining us again for our mentor session, having you come in and give us some wise words. How are you doing today? I'm doing well today. It's good to see you two brothers. I appreciate you and you know, I love what you, what's happening over at Laddering Your Success. Everybody is, as we say, when you start to climb, you you know what? Don't wait. You Each wrong one at a time. But I think the most important thing uh, that makes me happy is your introduction of your new podcast to really communicate not just who we are, what we do, why it matters, and, and how we can help transform and, and, and change lives by all the services and support that Larry and your success offers. So uh, thank you guys for having me on your podcast. It's, it's an honor and I'm, I'm a pleasure of mine. Oh, awesome. No, no. Fa thank you. Thank you, Brother Cleo. So earlier in part one, we talked a lot about your, your educational journey, your yes. formal and your informal educational journey. I want us to fast forward a little bit. So, you know, now you're a father, you're yes. a husband. And yes. so now you are tasked with, you know, leading the charge for your children as far as like their educational goals, those expectations, those same, those same things that you learn from your mother and your father. So if you can, just kind of after we fast forward it, I want you to go back and rewind and just yeah. think about your, like your mindset. What did you want for your kids after all of your experiences in, in education and in college? You know, what I wanted for my kids was an opportunity to do three things. Mm. One is to provide them access and exposure and experience to as many different environments, interests, areas of interest, activities that I felt and my wife felt would help you know, their development professionally and, and, and personally. And of course, when you say professionally, I don't separate personal and professional. I mean, if you're on time, <laughs> you're going to be on time, you know, when things matter to you personally or if they matter to you professionally. If you're considerate, you will be considerate professionally as well as personally. If, if you are, how can I say, a very curt individual that is impatient, you'll be impatient. <laughs> at work as well as at home. So these activities, these experiences, these act, this access to all these things that would help further expand their horizons of not just who they are, but help them really expand their mindset to see beyond themselves and to see different areas and, and really to, I want to say, ignite their imaginations and their curiosity because we live in a three-dimensional world. I mean, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the book Don Quixote and Don Quixote, or Sancho, his, 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 his carrying mate, and he would have his saber and look up into the clouds and, and fighting things that anyone else could not see. And he thought that he was fighting dragons and then, of course, taking down castles, but they were just windmills. So <laughs> if I don't see dragons and castles and all I see is a windmill, then all you see is a crazy man rattling his saber. That being said, it's important that we showcase things that people can see, touch, feel, and experience. And then that will further fuel the imagination to go further experience and, and broaden things that you may be interested in or things that you may not have thought of. So that's kind of what we wanted to do is mm. provide them access. Mm. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. That that idea of just exposure is so key. I mean, it, that's just so key because, yeah, that that's just so key because I yeah. Could do some, mm -hmm. No, I was just going to say, and, and, I, and I think it's the difference. I think exposure mm -hmm. and access mm -hmm. is the difference maker, and it also is a inhibitor when you are lacking exposure and when you're lacking access to experiences, to mentoring, to resources, to opportunities. And all we can do is what we can do from where we are. But from where you are, you're not limited. When it comes to curiously thinking of ways to provide additional opportunities to have your kids experience different things. 
or networks that will allow them to be a gateway and a platform to provide that exposure. So I, I just wanted to share that point only. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, no worries. No worries. Absolutely. So so if I, if I could ask this question and just thinking about part one and what we discussed in part one, can you talk about, and, and, and given what you just shared now, can you talk mm -hmm. about, you know, as, as a black man growing up, going through 70s and 80s and crack and right. all of those different types of things in Chicago, right? what, what were you exposed to that made you say, mm -hmm. I could be an executive as a Fortune 500 company, right? You know, yes. It, and, and that's a great question. Uh, what I was exposed to is a culture that existed within my household, first of all and foremost, that influenced talk us. Talk that talk, Doc. Talk that talk. Now, I, don't get me wrong. I, I'm, I'm from a family of educators. I, I have, there's a PhD in my family. My sister finished up her PhD this year in education. I have a brother that's a doctor in radiology. I have another brother that has his master's. I mean, I have my master's out of nine children. We were educated, academic, academically minded people, but we're also real. <laughs> and, and, and what we're real is that the limitations or the things that you can expect from an educational institution, I think you only can expect so much. But at home, I think it's important that, which was a gateway from us, my mother would take us to the library. We would walk nine blocks to the library. I can remember at four years of age, which was the most magical, wonderful place for me. And we would take out books that would just spur our interest and, and, and take us to places that we couldn't go, that we didn't have the money to go, but our minds were able to go just in that little place called a library. Mm. And so those types of activities or discussions with my, with, with my, my relatives and my uncles who were all very different, but you know, successful and some not successful, we had exposure to them as well. And also within my neighborhood. My neighborhood was full of very strong, successful people. But yet and still, there was a segment in my neighborhood that was, they would get you if they could. <laughs> and so I think having exposure to the people that are for you, the people that are trying to get you, and the people you know, that are just around you. I think it's important to learn from all those things. But first and foremost, within the home is where things were the command control center of really what was going to be the principles that define us and guide us. And we never lost sight of that. And also the church, which is, was an institution, but the family, church, the community center that we're involved in, we're involved in sports activities. We're also, I was a boy scout in the ghetto, right? Without question, we had a, a troop there. There's lots of different things that were created because I think there's gold where you least likely expect to find it. But if you have the curiosity to grind, to get the grit, to go out there and create things and not wait for someone to create, which my parents and some of the people in my community offer, was an option to those other things that could derail you. So that was very critical for me. And it really influenced my, my childhood and, you know, gave me the opportunity to know I'm not going this way. <laughs> I already see the end if someone were to go this particular route. And this route, I could consider it, but no, that's not for me. But based on the things that I'm interested in, based on the things that I feel that have guided me through my, my career and what I've seen in my parents and within my household, this is the way I'm going to go. But having exposure and experiences right there in front of you and that access gave me clarity of purpose, clarity of direction, clarity of vision, and also you know, the options to know what to do and what not to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm thinking right now of Brother Cleo and went in that Boy Scout uniform. All I can think <laughs> of is either reciting a poem. Scout's honor, tenderfoot. <laughs> showing somebody how to what, dance. What were those badges? Yeah, what were those badges growing up in Chicago? <laughs> you got all the badges. Hey. <laughs> like, like, you know? Yeah, um, but that's 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 definitely fire. And thank you for that, Cleo. I'm, I'm, I, again, I think it's just amazing how, again, just how real your upbringing was and must have been to create a person with balance. And so just a little bit, if you could talk 
about like social media and kind of how yeah. how from an executive standpoint, you know, you know, you're an executive as a company. So most executive, you're you're clocking in 60, 70, 80 hours a week, you know, you're traveling, you know, how are you raising your kids, you know, and balancing the whole social media thing? Because I think that's a, a pressure a lot of parents are feeling. Yeah, you know, it's every generation has a the pressures and some of the forces that are out there that could either put us on track or derail us. And I, I don't think that <laughs> no generation can avoid that. But I think the most important thing is, is that I want to talk about this generation of, of course, social media. The technology that affords this social media platform, I think is neither good nor bad. I think it's how technology is used and deployed. And so I do think it's tough today as, as, as a kid to grow up in today's society because I have to reach out for my phone. I mean, this is more than just a phone. This is a computer. This is the Google machine. This is everything that requires your attention if you allow it to. It is also the metaverse. <laughs> you could lose yourself into this phone. 1984, if you read 1984, George Orwell, he talks about this. And so what is, and, and the, the, the distractions or some of the ills of it, but I think there's some good in it as well. So it's all for me perspective. For me and my children, it's all about moderation. It's all about purpose and intent, but it's all about knowing the fact that relationships, as I use Don Quixote, the three-dimensional world, something you can see, touch, and feel, to make sure that you create an environment or activities that are going to engage all those senses outside of this. I mean, I, we can't replace it. It's here to stay. I think you, and I don't think you can supplement it. I think you just have to provide exposure that is going to stimulate the real one-on-one -on -one interactions, physical interactions and activities that really allows you to do what I'm going to do right now. Put this thing down. Whether it's a minute, minute, you know, or for a minute, 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 it doesn't matter. But it's all about balance. And that's what my wife and I did within all of each and every one of our children. Because it's, again, when you talk about balance, Festus, and you, you use that word, and I agree, I think it's the fact that to create balance, then something has to counter. You have to introduce something within one's life to counter some of the things that already exist. And so when you counter, it starts to level like this, okay? Mm. And so that's what we've done. We, our children were involved in music. They're involved in sports. They're involved in dance. They're involved in different other clubs and activities. We travel extensively. We had our time where we did game boards, where we would play Sorry or Monopoly. But it is so easy. And I'm just going to use this virtual metaverse that we that is spinning is a vortex that we can easily get caught into this and without those counters it's all this and what does all this does well it it, it really affects you mentally socially and i think it affects you physically as well because you're not very active i mean if you're playing games actively here when I could be out there, you know, throwing a football, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this. I'm not downing this. I'm just saying that you have to counter it as well and, and offset it. So that's what we've done. Oh, absolutely. I, you gave a wonderful game plan, I think, for parents that are dealing with dealing with that. Because like you said, they're not. It, it's not going anywhere. It's only going to get bigger. So, you know, the onus is on the parents to make sure that they're that they're leaving the charge with, with those things. And I, I just wanted to ask you quickly, did you ever have any struggles with your, with your children as they were coming with, as far as like finding their purpose or as a parent wanting them to go in a particular direction or 
just any type of any type of struggles because I think that's also an issue with our with our parents today is you know in the parent in the parenting guide one of the first things we talk about is what type of parent are you right, right. An authoritative parent are you authoritarian are you passive are you not present and how those play a role in how the child how your student kind of maneuvers in life and how how your your vision for them, you know, affects them. Or do you really understand how your, what your children likes? You mentioned, I, th I think it was in part one, how your parents understood each of you. Very right. Well. So just take a couple of seconds to talk about your, any struggles that you had in, in, in understanding that about. Yeah. Parents. Struggle. Every, every, every child is different and they, they bring and provide struggles for you. My parents had nine children, six boys, three girls. My wife's parents had 11, five five daughters and, and, and six sons, and each and every one of them are different. And so when you talk about a, a game plan or, or a, an approach or a construct to use when it comes to, to parenting, you know, I'm trying to remember aspects of your question, you know, and, or the challenges. Yeah, I, I, each children is going to provide different challenges for you. But it, let me let me say this. I think it's important that Similar to my parents, there's probably three things. One, and it depends on the stage we're in at a certain age, but early on in our life, there were some decisions that we didn't get to make. <laughs> I mean, it's, and I believe in that. I mean, how many decisions can a three-year-old or four-year-old make <laughs> without this wealth of information? Don't get me wrong. I'm going to take it into consideration, but... <laughs> There's just some decisions yeah. that you yeah. do not get a chance to make. I hear you, but you must do this. All right. We talk, might talk, yeah, that, talk, talk <laughs> that talk. Well, it's, it's just the truth of it. And my parents were that way. And, and, and my wife, Lois and I are that way. There were some decisions that they didn't make, but as they were developing, I think it's important that you meet children where they are based on who they are and what they're interested in and what really excites them and motivates them. And the only way to find that out is to spend time with your children. I mean, it's just like, you know, a candy wrapper that has that great piece of candy that you like. You just can't eat the wrapper with the candy because it tastes bad. You got to take your time. You got to work through it, open up the box you know, or go to the grocery store and get it. You have to put some work in. <laughs> you got to do the work to, to get to understand who they are, what matters to them, why it matters. And by doing so, you got to meet them where they are. I can't expect a five-year-old to be a 21-year-old. Nor do I expect a 21-year-old to, to be a 14-year-old. I have to meet him or her as, as they are. I think the last thing that when it comes to challenges that we faced, and I'll look at the way my parents and how they raised us. When we made mistakes, because I tell my kids this all the time and they're, they're grown, you will fail. <laughs> You're going to mess up. It's going to happen. But I want you to understand that some mistakes you can come back from, but some you can't. And by knowing that up front, we just try to detail examples of what those mistakes are. You have to live for the rest of your life. You know, a decision made, you know, basically for short-term pleasure is going to cause long-term pain. <laughs> and so we just try to give them this. When you make a decision to think about, you know, don't be hasty about it, emotional about it, but sit on it, think about it. And when you think about it, what are the advantages and what are the negatives to it? What are the disadvantages? And we, so we give them that little tea bar to, as a leisure. And they use that to this day just to think through it and sit on it, let it bake. The second thing is if you make a mistake, we're not going to be our told you so parents, and we're not. We're going to be, okay, what do we do? What do we learn from this mistake? How big is the mistake? How do we take this mistake and, you know, deal with it? Because you have to be accountable for it and you got to be responsible for the outcome. And I think that's been real, really good for my kids. So we're not, a, you know, I told you not to do this. Or, you know what, boy, you know, when you 
you know, because kids are going to be hard on themselves. They know they made a mistake. I mean, I think they beat themselves up. I was that way. I, you know, you didn't have to tell me when I did bad. I knew it. And I think the last thing is this. When I'm searching for answers, I think it's important that you as a parent in what we try to do and what my parents did as well, they were there to support and assist, but they were not ready to give us a solution. <laughs> and that was hard for them. And it's hard for me because you don't want to see your kids suffering. You don't want to see them struggling, but you know what? There's something about the struggle where it is so essential for you to grow and you have to go through that struggle. And if I were to provide the answer very quickly, they wouldn't know struggle. And second of all, if I were to provide that answer for them, as opposed to just giving them assistance, support, if the result of that answer went wrong, well, dad, you know, you told me I should have did this. <laughs> you know, that's on you. So those are some of the things that I want to share with you and parents out there today that I think is important. I'm not going to say it's magic. I'm just telling you what worked for me and also what I know to be true from others as well. But I think better to, to, to have some sort of game plan or guidebook than to, to go out there and I call it managing by meandering, yeah. which I do not like to do. <laughs> no, that's, that's powerful. I think, was it, was it Marcus Garvey who had the quote, without struggle, there can be no progress. You know, correct. and so I think that is, that's so true. That is, that is so true. So, so thank you for that. All and, I, and one of the things, and one thing too, Festus, and, and I know I don't want my kids to go through this. I don't want them to have to deal with this. You know what? I want my kids to deal with it and I'm going to help them understand, you know, a way to how to get through it because I cannot erase struggle from their lives. I just got to help them with it. Thank you. Festus. That is powerful. That is powerful. Ole? So I, th I think the, the key that I took from that is something very important that a lot of our kids aren't able to do today, which is to critically think. Yes. I think a lot of our, a lot of our students today are not able to critically think. And I think there's a power behind what you said about letting the kid process the information and make a calculated decision. I think that uh, that's very, very key because I think we live in a world today where a lot of our young people are very quick to follow the crowd and not necessarily think for themselves. So that, that and, is truly powerful. And Ole, just, you keep the point, but you know, we live in a ADD society where we can't even stand to go through the drive through window which is the fastest lane. I didn't have a drive through one of us. I mean, it's, you know, drive up, carry out. And we're like, come on with it. <laughs> I mean, we want everything quick. I, it's just gratification. I call it this hedonistic self, instant gratification that, by the way, this provides that also fosters that. And so we don't have to struggle because I can get it right here. No, you, you, they're struggling every day. But anyway, I just want to add that, Ole. No, absolutely. Please, please continue. So lastly, we wanted to talk about the third book that you've written. Yeah, thank what you. What do you see when you look at me, which which I have read and I, and I absolutely loved. I'm not going to say it was a tearjerker, but it did elicit a lot of those feelings I had when I was a, a very, you know, a small kid, just having conversations about, with my mom and my dad. Tell us about the book, where did it come from, and, and, you know, what it's about. Yeah, I'm very proud of this book. It's a collaboration with my, my youngest son, who is high-functioning Asperger's and on the spectrum of autism. Very talented man. He has his own voiceover business, a, a very talented actor in the Houston Community Theater District as well. He's graduated from Lone Star College, sharp, smart, but he has Asperger's, and when he was growing up, it challenged, it challenged him, but it challenged others and how they viewed him. And they would see some of the things that he would do that allowed them to see him only through this spectrum, a very narrow lens. And children are like icebergs. 
And by the way, as we told our son, Michael, you know, you may have Asperger's, but guess what? Everybody's got something. Some people talk too much. Some people don't listen. And by the way, some of the things that you are complaining about, other people are praying for. So what you have is what you have, but it will not be a reason why you cannot. And so that being said, others would place limitations on him. And of course, as I've talked about how we are, our culture and our family, and no, there's no, we don't put a fence around creativity, imagination. And, and children's imagination or creativity is their superpower. And this book really ignites and it, it really sparks a two-way conversation with children and their parents, read out loud, read along, to think about how others see them, how they see themselves, their aspirations and how they see themselves currently and how they see themselves as they aspire to be in the future. And also it has that conversation to bring it back to people from diverse backgrounds, all right? Their friends, people within their communities that we're all asking these questions about what we can be. And in the end, how we see ourselves is not predicated on how others see us. It's really about the unlimited possibilities that comes from here and that partnership and collaboration through parent and child to nurture that spark of creativity to what a child can be. And so that is the impetus. That's the reason for the book. And my son is an example of placing no limitations on his creativity and not letting others limit him placed on their expectations. So a very positive, powerful book. I think that's simply uh, wonderfully illustrated by Olivia Bolson. And I, I hope others who read it like it. Yeah, I can definitely say, I think this is probably the most powerful book of the decade the most powerful children's book of the decade. And I say that because I think a lot of children struggle with identity. They struggle with this imposterism that comes from like social media. And I think this is a very simple way of being able to, to start, start when they're young and, you know, kind of impress upon them that they should be dictating what what their view of the world is for themselves to others in a, in a positive way. Right. So I think that there's people doing that, but, uh, but they're not the most positive. So I'm, <laughs> I, I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there. So, but yeah, that. we, 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 we're, we're grateful again for you carving the time out of your busy schedule to, to, to spend time with us, to share with us, to, to ignite and inspire the listeners and, and even us, you know, here, because, because so often, Cleo, you, you, you get that little spark going back <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> we're, when we're running on fumes, you're, you're the, yeah. you're the little, the Flint rock, <laughs> you know, yeah, get, making us, it work. <laughs> get us going. So, so we appreciate you. And so if you have any closing remarks and then Ole will wrap us up. You know, the, the remarks that I want to just share and, and, and guys, thank you for engaging me and allowing me and give me honor to, to be a part of your podcast. I'm a big fan. <laughs> I love I love the content. I love the dialogue and I love the discussion. It's, it's not scripted. As we say, it's real talk and hope people get a lot out of it. But I, I will share this. I think it's important that we understand that the things that we do resonate from generations from here and beyond. And when it comes to this children's book or my other leadership books, that I've written, the inspiration is all about activating the purpose, the creativity, imagination, the aspirations for those who are here, yet for those to become, because it's bigger than us. And it's all about legacy. And I'll leave it at this. There's something that guides me. And I'm not a perfect man. I just do my best. But Deuteronomy 6, 10, and 12. And I think this is what it's all about. And this is what guides me. Is summed up by this. We drink from wells we did not dig, and we sit in the shade 
of trees that we did not plant. Mm. That is my purpose, is to provide access, is to share my talent, my time and treasures to help others dig wells so that others may drink from those wells from generations to come and to plant trees so that others may sit in the shade of trees they did not plant because we are the beneficiaries of those before us that dug wells for the water that we drink today and the shade that shielded us from this Houston heat <laughs> from the trees that they plant. So it's important that what we do today will ring and resonate and reverberate from generations to come. So thank you very much. And I think that's what it's all about because it's bigger than us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I don't think I could have ended it any better myself. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. <laughs> Cleo, brother Cleo, thank you so much for, like you said, taking the time out of your, your busy day to come in and, and bless us really with those wonderful words, with your story. We, we, we so appreciate it. Thank you so much. Cleo Franken Jr. Professor Samoye, thank you for setting this up. Thank you as always. For those of you out there, you just watched the part, part two of our, we can call this conversation with Cleo, actually. <laughs> um, we can call this our conversation with Cleo. This is part two. So for Cleo Franklin, for Professor Samoye, I am Ole Sharanki. Remember folks, there are legitimate reasons to not going to college. There are no legitimate reasons to not getting an education. Thank you so much for joining us and make sure you continue to keep your circle strong as you climb your way up, as you ladder your success. All right. Take care now. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Oh, you're still there? Well, thank you so much for listening to the LYS podcast. 